Jerusalem, city of history whose origins are lost in the mists of antiquity. Jerusalem, holy city, religious capital of half of the human race. From its barren hills, philosophers and prophets have launched eternal laws of morality, brotherly love, and peace. Jerusalem, the world's most sacred city, also a city of terror, war, and blood. More wars have been fought at its gates than in any city in the world. To walk in and around Jerusalem is to walk over a sea of human blood. And the spilled blood here in Jerusalem of one man has affected and shaped the course of human events as no other in all of history. This man called Jesus came down from the hills to Jerusalem to teach his sense of God and his law, and claiming to be the son of God, created a furor within the powers that reigned. Knowing this, Jesus called together his disciples within the walls of the city for a last supper, for he had knowledge of what was to come. And in this room, he made his farewells and established his sense of communion with God and himself for all Christians, for all times. Later that night, he and his followers went to a spot favored by Jesus for rest and prayer, the Garden of Gethsemane. Here, during the night, he suffered his most sorrowful hour and made his choice. And in this garden they came and arrested him and took him into the city to await trial. And on this now hallowed ground, Jesus Christ was condemned to death. They bound him naked to a column and beat him. In Hebraic law, the strokes were limited to 39. Roman slaves received 40. But for the man called Jesus, there was no limit. He was beaten so severely, his skin became detached, blood poured out. At each stroke, his body shuddered, but he remained silent, provoking the rage of his executioners. Finally, the flogging stopped. They moved him to the other side where they threw an old cloak on his shoulders and put a reed in his hands for a scepter, and they plaited some wooden stocks covered with thorns and dug the caplet into his scalp. And each executioner in turn bowed before him and mocked, Hail, King of the Jews. His silence was returned with anger, and they took a stick and smashed it across his nose. A blow on the head, and the crown of thorns dug deeper into his scalp. They tore the cloak from him and placed a crossbeam weighing over a hundred pounds on his bleeding shoulders, and made him walk barefoot on the stony road to Calvary. Often he fell, scraping his knees, which were already raw. The crossbeams dug into his shoulders, and the wounds became deeper with each painful step. Finally, they arrived at the top of Golgotha, and he sank to his knees, and the crucifixion began. They hammered a nail in each wrist. The excruciating pain shot through his fingers, his hands, his shoulders, but still he did not cry out. His body was suspended by his arms, and his head leaned forward because the thorny crown prevented him from leaning against the cross. And they bent his knees and hammered nails in his feet. And all the muscles of his body began to spasm and cramp and his face turned blue. And for three hours he remained on the cross, barely able to breathe until finally he cried out, Father, into thy hands 
I commend my spirit. And he died. And a soldier drove a lance deep into his side and out came blood and water. And Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple of Jesus, in haste, for it was the eve of Passover Sabbath and all work had to cease by sundown, hurriedly obtained permission from Pilate and with the help of Nicodemus, who brought with him a mixture of spices and a long linen cloth, as well as the Hebraic custom of burial, took down the body from the cross and followed by others, took the body and laid it in a newly hewn tomb in a garden close to Golgotha to await final burial on Sunday morning. And sometime in the ensuing hours, the air around the tomb became electric. A trembling of the earth occurred, accompanied by a blinding, pulsating, radiant glow from within the tomb, causing the Roman guards to flee in fear and panic. On Sunday morning, Mary Magdala saw that the stone had been moved away from the tomb and ran to the disciples, Peter and John. They came running and entered the tomb and saw only the linen cloth lying there. Today, in Turin, Italy, there is a linen cloth dating back to the time of Christ. This cloth is kept in a crypt above the high altar in a private chapel in the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. It has been here for 400 years. And on it is an image of a man who wore a caplet of thorns, whose side was pierced, who was brutally beaten and crucified. Looking from the cathedral into the once private royal chapel of the House of Savoy, deposed ruling House of Italy, we see the grill in the altar, behind which is kept the cloth or holy shroud as it is known. Sealed behind three locks, it is kept rolled up within a four-foot-long silver casket, kept in an iron chest wrapped in asbestos in a long wooden box. It is 14 feet, three inches long by three feet, seven inches wide. And it brings us to the incredible question, is it truly the burial cloth of Jesus Christ? For many centuries, this question has been the source of constant controversy. And for this reason, it has rarely been unveiled but has been revered by its believers as Christendom's most holy relic. But now, to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the Holy Shroud in its present home, it is to be put on view for the public for the first time in 45 years, for a period of six weeks. There is to be a press conference for the official announcement of the unveiling. There is a hushed but obvious excitement as news people gather from all over the world the excitement is not only for the possible impact on the public, but also for the impending meeting of scientists from all over the world at the end of the exposition. A meeting to work out, if granted permission, further tests on the authenticity of the Holy Shroud. Tests that began in earnest in the 60s and through the 70s. We meet here a principal character in this drama, Father Peter Rinaldi a man who has devoted a lifetime to the cause of making the Shroud known to the world. Inside the church, Monsignor Anastasio Balestrero, Cardinal of Turin, welcomes the press. He states that the displaying of the sacred Shroud is not motivated in any way but as an instrument in showing Jesus Christ, the savior of mankind, in whom all Christians believe and base their religious serenity. He hopes that this occasion will give all interested people in the world a truly spiritual experience. While the press enthusiastically photographs this ancient relic, the church readies itself for the first viewers. The exposition does not officially begin till tomorrow, but there will be a special mass said and those on hand will be privileged to see the sacred shroud before the opening.
we see the earliest pilgrims arriving for this religious experience in rather sparse numbers. As custodians of the Shroud since the exile of the royal family in 1946, the Church of Turin, the Cardinal and his offices have complete control over all matters pertaining to this most sacred relic. In arranging for this exposition, the official posture of the Church becomes apparent. They are not openly against all the scientific testing, but are extremely cautious about rushing into things. Their posture states that it matters not to them of scientific proofs. This burial cloth with an image of Christ on it is simply an unspoken article of faith and the most revered relic in all of Christendom. But what of the projections of the expected number of people who will come to see the shroud? From opening day, it becomes apparent, beyond all expectations. In the next weeks, over three million people will make the pilgrimage from all over the world and crowd into this plaza. Many have waited a lifetime for this opportunity. This begins a coverage by worldwide media and a spreading of the knowledge of the Shroud throughout the world. Could it be its time in history? What of this article of centuries of veneration? It is kept up a circular staircase behind this door to the exquisitely designed and understated circular chapel. In the preceding 48 hours, in total secrecy, with no fanfare whatsoever, the Holy Shroud is taken out, carefully unrolled, and put into a bulletproof glass encasement filled with a special gas to protect it and mounted for the showing. As we go down into the main church, we see the no longer used royal box to the left of the mounting of the shroud. To the right, a magnificent organ mounted over a small altar. How does one describe the shroud? A long, parallel cloth. Consider someone lying down on a long cloth, lengthwise, head at the middle, feet at the end. And from the middle, the cloth lifted over the head and covering the person so that both ends of the cloth meet. It is astonishing how pale and subtle the image appears, a pure sepia, one tone. And now, we are looking at the holy image between the parallel lines of triangular repair patches. From the feet on the left, up the frontal image to the face, and then to the back image.
six weeks after opening day, the Second International Congress and Symposium on the Shroud and Science convened in the Hall of Congress. An icon depicting the shroud that had been covered for decades was discovered accidentally by painters cleaning the building. Mere coincidence or an omen of what is to come. Arriving is an impressive assemblage of scientific and religious scholars from all over the world. Men and women who have devoted years of study and research to solving the mysteries of the sacred shroud. Some believe and some doubt. But all seem to be totally enwrapped with the subject and constantly urging more and more investigation to unlock the secrets of the shroud. And unlike the more conservative church leaders, many religious scholars meeting here are crying out for worldwide recognition of the authenticity of the shroud through scientific proof. Just think of the implications. But what one single event occurred that created this scientific zeal in the study of what up to then was simply a centuries-old venerated religious relic? What event began a movement that is now embracing all facets of space-age science and research? Turin, 1898. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Italian Constitution, the Holy Shroud of Turin will be publicly displayed at the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. For the first time in history, the royal family has consented to let the relic be photographed. If the cloth is destroyed, there will at least remain a photographic record. The photographer, Secundo Pia, an amateur with several awards, was chosen and was nervously waiting when the royal procession left the cathedral. There was so little to see on the long, yellowish cloth with the strange markings. Only a vague outline of what looked like two men, but was actually only one visible front and back. All his life, Secundo Pia had been told the man was Jesus Christ. He had to get a perfect photograph. The church, the king, the world was waiting for it. There was no automatic focus or shutter speed in those days. Everything depended on the amount of time a photographic plate was exposed to light through the open lens. Pierre had decided on two exposures, one 14 minutes and one 20. The impatient crowds could be heard outside waiting to enter. He had only two hours before the church would reopen. The time was going by so quickly. What if he hadn't focused properly? Too late to think about that now. In his dark room, Secundo was even more nervous. He felt relief as he saw the negative image begin to appear under the developer. His hands shook as he held up the dripping glass. Was it possible? His negative plate contained a positive image instead of the vague impression he had seen on the cloth. Here was a complete photographic likeness of a man whose body was covered with clotted blood, whose side showed a large wound, and whose hands and feet showed the marks of one crucified. In chilling awe, he found himself thinking that he was the first man in almost 2,000 years to gaze on the actual appearance of the body of Christ. Is it possible that there can actually be a photograph of Jesus Christ after 2,000 years? And how does an image of the human body become transformed onto a piece of cloth? This photograph with Pierre in the last row, taken amidst many accusations that Pierre's photographs were fake, hangs on a wall in his son's office. And with a portrait of the elderly peer in the background, we ask Giuseppe Pierre of his memories of his father. There are many memories that bind me to my father. For instance, I remember his mood during the intense waiting period before his work began. The nervousness he felt when he exposed the negative and developed the picture. The emotions he felt when he saw the shroud appear on the plate are known to all because of what has been written. Sono ormai di dominio universale perché tutti gli scritti 
riportano questo suo ricordo. Un altro punto sul quale insisteva per un suo orgoglio, diciamo quasi personale, era di aver avuto per primo l'idea di fotografare la sindone e di aver voluto questa concessione con assoluto disinteresse. Another point on which he used to insist, because of his pride, was that he was the first to get the idea to photograph the shroud, but he was not interested in this being attributed to him. Unfortunately, there were many discussions afterwards concerning the merits of his work, but time has done him justice. The photographic process was legitimate and not due to tricks or chemical manipulations. I also remember that he was extremely proud that the royal house and the church authorities trusted him. He was flattered that they gave the assignment to an amateur photographer, even the best amateur in Turin. Another point is that he opened a new page in the history of the shroud. Without the photographs, the shroud would have remained deserving of devotion, but subjected to doubts and hesitations which come up when a relic has not been proved absolutely true. Naturally, I cannot give you any hypothesis when such an important congress and many significant participants are about to resolve scientific and religious doubt about this illustrious relic of Turin. Turin. 1931. To celebrate the marriage of King Umberto's son, the Holy Shroud is once again displayed to the public for the first time in 33 years. After much hesitation, the King agrees to let the relic be photographed by Giuseppe Enrie of Turin. Astonished, Enrie examines his developed slides. Like Pierre, his negative plates have mysteriously taken on the properties of positive images. Leo Valla, one of London's top photographers, explained this phenomenon. Unlike most images, the image on the shroud is a negative image. That means it's reversed from what we would consider to be normal, if we weren't photographers, that is. The result of this is that the the result that would normally appear in the camera as a negative, in fact, appears to positive. Could be very, it was obviously very startling to the first person who photographed the, sh the shroud, because this strange image of uh, a few rather indeterminate smudges turned out in the darkroom to be uh, a photographic image, a positive image of very high quality, but at the negative stage. I think the, the quality of the photographs was absolutely superb. The negative itself was a very well-graded, sharp, although, of course, a lot of the sharpness was the texture on the cloth, but the, it was in completely clear focus. The gradation was perfect. The lighting appeared to be soft, good portrait lighting. And um, the resultant positive was a portrait of just tremendous photographic quality. My job is illusion, for example. I can one, I can put somebody in front of a, uh, have someone standing on the cobbles in Paris one minute and standing on the sands in front of the pyramids the next minute and skiing the next. This is quite routine. But with all these modern resources, I consider it to be impossible for anybody to take a positive image and draw it in any way with airbrushes or any technique at all into a, a negative so that when it were re-photographed could be anything except a caricature. I consider this to be absolutely impossible. The image that is on the shroud is a true photographic image, in my opinion, untouched by hand, not made by man. On the shroud itself, the face appears like the positive on the left. When re-inverted by the photographic process, as seen on the right, the negative slide looks positive. The face shows a swelling on the bridge of the nose and on the right cheek. There is a contusion below the right eye and great damage to the left cheek, nose and lower lip. The deepest wounds, though, appear on the crown of the head. 
There is a blood clot on the forehead, like an inverted three, and possibly took this form because the brow was wrinkled. The blood marks on the back of the head have been caused by something sharp and pointed, such as a caplet of thorns put on the head and set down with binding material, which would have arrested further descent of these blood clots. The wound on the side marked by a dark stain of flowing blood can be seen on the right side between the fifth and sixth ribs. The nail wound on the wrist is highlighted by a large patch of blood. Trickles of blood on both forearms from the pierced wrists suggest the arms were raised above the head. The scourgements are most noticeable on the upper dorsal region. They are paired, suggesting that a Roman flagrum was used. This whip was provided with paired knobs of lead or bone, and there are 125 marks on the back. The skin had been stripped away. The lower dorsal imprint shows both feet turned inward, the knees bent, one crossed over the other. Rigor mortis kept the feet rigid in that position. In the Congress, everything is moving ahead. Authorities covering many diversified approaches to the study of the shroud. Professor Gerard Egger, director of the library and collector of arts of the Vienna Museum, whose subject is proving the authenticity of the shroud from the point of view of the history of art. Professor Ettore Morano, director of the Microscopic Institute, who is reporting on ultra-structural aspects with electronic microscopic scans of the fiber of the shroud. <laughs> Professor A. Faye of the Catholic Institute of Paris, discussing the identification and disposition of shroud material from the cloth of Jesus according to the fourth gospel. Professor Albert Brandoni, University of Pavia, with an analysis of neutronic activations in the studies of the Shroud of Turin. Di diversi ricercatori appartenenti a varie nazioni. This Congress would not be complete without eminent historian and author Ian Wilson being involved and contributing his staunch support for further testing on the shroud. We talked with Mr. Wilson in his home surroundings in England and asked him why the recorded history of the shroud begins in the year 1353 and not before. My theory has been to look at what has been thought up to the present time to have been an entirely different relic, the image of Edessa or Mandelian that has been variously described. This came to light during the early 6th century in the small city of Edessa in Syria. And on it, it was the image or impression of Christ's features in a very similar manner to that that we see on the Shroud of Turin. How did it get there? According to the legend, King Abga of Edessa was suffering from an incurable disease. And hearing of Christ's miracles, he sent a messenger to Jerusalem asking Christ to come to Edessa and cure him. Jesus sent back a message that he could not come, but after his death and resurrection, he would send one of his disciples to heal King Abgar's disease. Christ kept his word. The apostle Thaddeus came to Edessa carrying a burial cloth on which was clearly portrayed the image of Christ. And immediately, as Abgar saw it, a great vision appeared to him and he bowed down before the apostle and was healed. The cloth became known as the Holy Face of Edessa, and we know it today as the Holy Shroud of Turin.
Abgar V of Edessa is a verifiable historical personality. He reigned from AD 13 to AD 50. No historian will dispute this. Nor will any historian dispute the fact that Christianity was established here in Rome immediately after Christ's death. But because Christianity was considered a threat to the stability of imperial rule, Nero ordered Christians killed. The persecution continued during the second and third centuries. Yet the early Christians held firm to their faith. They dug tunnels deep into the ground into volcanic rock where they continued to practice their religion. With a tremendous echo, it would be easy to hear the Roman soldiers clanking through the long, winding tunnels. The Christians were also buried in these clandestine places, which exist to this day, called catacombs, meaning down through the hollow place. Catacombs are found in the most unlikely places. For instance, underneath this place are bones dating back 1,600 years. Ten years ago, during the construction of an apartment house, these catacombs were discovered, which date back to the third century. Father Umberto Barnabita, keeper of the catacombs of Italy, took us on a tour to trace the portraits of Christ through the centuries. The first images of Christ which appear at the end of the second century are completely symbolic. Christ appears as a young shepherd with a sheep on his shoulders. In the third century, he is seen as a teacher. He no longer has the aspects of a young man, but is depicted aged in order to show his knowledge and wisdom. In the 4th century portraits, there seems to be some relationship with the image of Edessa, which was known in Rome at that time. The rich Christians were buried in tombs, but the poor were buried in hollowed out graves along walls. Finally, Father led us to this sixth century portrait, which he feels is directly related to the Holy Shroud. He explained that from the sixth century on, portraits of Christ changed dramatically. The sixth century is critical in the history of the likeness of Christ in art. From the sixth century on, we have the clear, defined portrait of Christ that we have up to the present time. And on the apse of uh, many churches throughout Christendom, this was featured uh, in a fine frescoes and mosaics, which were always front-facing and this frontality corresponds closely with the frontality that we see on the shroud. When we look at the portraits of Christ that have come down to us in art, which I believe were related to the shroud, we must first of all bear in mind that those people who looked at the shroud were in fact looking at the cloth as it looked to the naked eye. And this gives us certain features and the copies of the Edessa image similarly bear these features, one of them being the impression of eyes open, not closed in death, as we know they were on the shroud. 
These features were studied in detail by the French author Paul Vignon, who found that there were certain defects and irregularities in the cloth, which became reproduced by artists uh, copying the likeness of Christ through the centuries. These were a small square, a topless square to the forehead, a small triangle in the middle of the, on the, on the bridge of the nose, um, lines to the side of the face, um, plus the more easily viewable features such as the fork to the beard. All these features for Paul Vignon showed the shroud had been in existence previous to the 14th century. What he wasn't able to determine was where the shroud was in order for them to have been copied. My belief is that these artists were copying from the relic that was then known as the image of Edessa and that we know today as the Shroud of Turin. If Ian Wilson's belief is true, then the history of the Shroud can be relatively well traced. During the extreme persecution of the Christians in the first century, the image of Edessa is hidden in a niche above Edessa's west gate for safekeeping. For centuries, it rests completely unknown in hermetically sealed conditions. Kept inaccessible because of its holiness, it survives over the next 400 years through invasion in both Byzantine and Muslim empires and their iconoclastic movements. It leaves Edessa, which is under a state of siege in the year 944, as a trade for sparing the city and is taken to Constantinople. On August the 16th of that year, it is given a permanent place in the Chapel of the Pharos on the right-hand side facing east. It is kept there in safety until April the 12th, 1204. When the Crusaders, full of hatred and envy of the Byzantine world, attack Constantinople, burst through its walls and destroy everything in their path, churches and palaces alike, it takes them three days to sack and wreck the city. disappears. It does not turn up again until 1353, 152 years later, in the possession of Geoffrey de Charnay, the first recorded owner in the West. No one knows how the de Charnay family gained ownership. Many historians think it might have fallen into the hands of the Templar Knights, a crusader order of warrior monks who worshipped an idolatrous head until they were suppressed in the 14th century. A wooden copy of this head has been found at Templecombe in Somerset, England. This head seems to be related to the shroud. It is bearded, front facing, and the eyes are open. When the order was suppressed, the last two Templars burned at the stake in 1314 included a Geoffrey de Charnay, who through a possible family link might have passed the shroud unrecorded to the Geoffrey de Charnay who possessed the shroud in the 1350s. In 1453, Margaret de Charnay, granddaughter of Geoffrey, heir to the shroud, childless and in her 70s, concerned about the future welfare of the shroud, made her choice and against strong opposition from the church at Liray, took the relic to the court of Chambéry in France and presented it to Duke Louis of Savoy for safekeeping in exchange for which he received two castles. A highly devout family, the Duke of Savoy had a special chapel built for it which he called Saint-Chapelle. The church was next to his palace and he entered regularly through a special door to pray to the holy relic. The shroud was kept in a long silver box behind a grilled gate near the altar. Because it was so accessible, pilgrims would take it out of the box and handle it. So the casket was moved to a niche 
high above the altar. Suddenly, one night in 1532, the tapestries in the church caught fire, and within minutes, the flames engulfed the silver casket. The Duke's blacksmith and two priests rushed through the inferno, grabbed the casket, and dashed from the burning church, thus saving this most holy of relics. The shroud did not escape the fire undamaged. Drops of molten silver caused the extensive burn marks that disfigure the cloth to this day. Nuns repaired the relic by sewing on triangular patches which seemed to create a parallel frame for the image. In 1578, the shroud was brought to Turin in a wooden casket with an official document declaring its authenticity sealed to the inside of the locked door. Duke Emmanuel Philibert of the House of Savoy used the safety of the shroud as an excuse to move his capital to Turin and to take permanent residence in this palace, thus the move in 1578. During these years, expositions of the shroud became a regular feature of Turin life. Each May the 4th, the Duke's family and dignitaries would assemble in front of the palace, which was crammed with spectators. Three bishops would hold up the shroud before the people. The enthusiasm of the Dukes of Savoy over the decades for the relic they cherished never diminished. By the end of the 17th century, it was decided that the shroud needed a new and larger chapel to house it. In these rooms, the discussions occurred and the brilliant architect Guarino Guarini was commissioned to design it. He carefully planned to link cathedral and chapel so that the royal family need not descend amongst the people. On June the 1st, 1694, with new small repairs having been made on the shroud and with much ceremony, the shroud was carried into the chapel that has been its home up to the present and was locked away behind the grill above the high altar. The casket was donated to the Holy Shroud Museum where it is now kept with documents relating to the shroud. The curator of the museum is Father Don Piero Coero Borga, also totally dedicated to the cause of worldwide recognition of the shroud, seen here addressing the Congress. Dr. Max Fry, Swiss criminologist, expert in the science of pollen analysis, has for years been painstakingly investigating the dust particles lifted off the shroud by the simple process of pressing clear adhesive tape onto the surface of the cloth. Under his microscope, he has found pollen in the dust particles to be of greatest interest. Pollen grains have extremely resistant walls. Invisible to the naked eye, these grains can and do retain their characteristics for millions of years. By simple analysis of the pollen grains, one can deduce where and when an object such as the shroud has been, geographically. Dr. Fry has made no claims as yet. It takes a tremendous amount of time, but the probabilities are most exciting. Dr. Robert Bucklin, forensic pathologist of Texas. Most of the present-day medical work pertaining to the shroud revolves around Dr. Buckley. The main interest of medical people is the anatomical accuracy of the image, the blood stains, the physical characteristics and bone structure, any data drawn from what is visible on the image. Common knowledge among these scientists is that the man on the shroud is approximately 5 feet 11 inches tall, powerful and well proportioned, weighing 175 pounds with pleasing facial features. Being mainly interested in the wounds and flow of blood of this crucifixion victim, Dr. Bucklin states clearly that it would be impossible to go into detail but does list the injuries to the body. Wrist, feet, back and front of the torso, the head and the lesion in the chest. 
He goes on to describe these injuries and states that the most controversial is the wound in the chest, causing the blood and water to flow as stated in the Gospels. He emphatically states that the cause of death was due to respiratory asphyxia. But the beliefs and findings of medical people like these were not always so welcomed and respected especially when it had anything to do with religion. Paris, April the 21st, 1902. Yves Delage, one of France's most distinguished scientists and an agnostic is to present to the Academy of Science at the Sorbonne a report entitled The Image of Christ Visible on the Holy Shroud of Turin. An utter silence descends on the crowd as the name Yves Delage is called. Delage tells his listeners of a strip of linen. He details the history, describes the naturalism of the bloodstains, the complexity of the wounds left by flogging, the wound in the wrist, the impeccably realistic picture of the face. For these and other reasons, I am convinced that the image of the shroud is not a painting made by human hand, but has been obtained by a physiochemical phenomenon. And the scientific question one must ask is this. How can a corpse yield an image on a shroud which covers it, causing it to reproduce its shape with all the details of the facial features? Must I speak of the identification of the person whose image appears on the shroud? Delage describes the victim on the shroud. He has been crucified, flogged, pierced in the side, and crowned with a caplet of thorns. He then reminds the audience of the story of a man who suffered these identical punishments. Is it not natural to bring these two parallels together and tie them to the same object? Let us add to this that in order for the image to have formed itself without being ultimately destroyed, it was necessary that the corpse remain in the shroud at least 24 hours, the amount of time needed for the formation of the image and at most several days, after which a putrefaction sets in, which destroys the image and finally the shroud. Tradition tells us that this is precisely what happened to Christ, dead on Friday and disappeared on Sunday. The man in the shroud was Christ. There are always outstanding people in every profession. The late Dr. David Willis, beside his contributions over the years as a medical man regarding the Shroud, his diligence and commitment to creating and maintaining interest in the Holy Shroud was second to none. One of the questions we asked him was also about the exact cause of death of the man of the Shroud. Now, the uh, common practice of disposing of the crucified was to break their legs, uh, the thighs, and this would throw the whole weight of the body onto the wrists. And so there would be a dramatic lowering of blood pressure and death would ensue very quickly. And I think that the same reason operated in the case of Christ, namely that he died from asphyxia. According to St. John in the Gospel, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once out came blood and water. Now, there have been various theories to explain this blood and water, uh, which St. John observed. The first is Barbe's, which has held sway for a, a long time. 
namely that the blood came from the right oracle, which would contain blood at death, and that the water was uh, a clear fluid from the pericardial sac. And he postulated uh, this gaping tunnel through which the blood from the right oracle and the fluid from the pericardial sac could um, emerge. The second theory is that of Dr. Anthony Sava, an American surgeon. He postulates that there was a hemorrhagic exudate into the pleural cavity, and that under the influence of gravity, that is the three hours of Christ on the cross, the red cell sank to the bottom, leaving the clear serous area above. When the spear entered the pleural cavity, the blood and water was already awaiting to be evacuated. The blood first, and then the water. Uh, traditionally, in uh, art and sculpture, the nails are shown through the palms of the hands. Now, Barbe, the French surgeon, did experiments on freshly amputated arms, and he found that if he drove a nail through the palm of the hand, uh, and attached a weight of 100 pounds to it, that it eventually tore through the ligaments. But if he put it through the carpus, which is a group of uh, small bones, eight of them, with very strong ligaments binding them together, and this is where the wound of the wrist is shown in the, in the shroud, he could put a weight of up to 240 pounds and it wouldn't tear through. Something extraordinary must have happened inside the tomb at the moment of the resurrection, because scripture tells us that the guards fled in panic from it. One wonders, therefore, that at, whether at the moment of the resurrection, some incandescence or radiation emanated for, from the res resurrected body of Christ, and at the split second uh, moment, uh, formed this negative image on the shroud in the same way as negative images were formed on stone when the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Is it possible? There are startling similarities. The theory that the image might have been caused by some form of controlled radiation is more and more taking hold. Ground zero of the explosion. Here is a radiation scorch. These are not shadows we see, but prints and images of the shadows formed by the blast which lightened the surrounding area around the shadows and left the darkened images. Dr. Eric Jumba of the United States Air Force, who along with Dr. John Jackson, also of the Air Force, have formed a team and have taken leadership in America over all space age research on the shroud. Extensive literature search and a series of carefully prepared experiments. First, it is unlikely that the shroud image is composed of any known or unknown coloration medium that could have been used by an artist. Second, it is extremely unlikely that the shroud image is produced by body exudations, grave preparation oils, and or burial spices. Considering the observations available at this time, the most likely image composition is a thermal discoloration, that is, a scorch. Uh, we're standing here with Professor Giovanni Tamburelli. Professor Giovanni Tamburelli, telecommunications expert is interviewed about his computer experiments with the image on the shroud. If you could possibly, for the American public, uh, give us your summation in English of your findings to date on the shroud, on the Holy Shroud itself, and some of your thoughts on that. Mm, yes, uh, we have uh, studied the um, digital uh, elaboration of uh, 
uh, by the computer of the shroud image. Uh, we have um, uh, produced uh, two images, uh, one with a, a high, uh, high de de definition uh, uh, to see all uh, the details, uh, to see if uh, these uh, details correspond to uh, the gospel. And so, uh, in particularly, we have uh, seen uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, that, uh, the eyelids on, uh, on the face uh, uh, as a, a um, indication uh, of, uh, uh, of a coin uh, which has, has uh, uh, compressed uh, the, the eyelids on right uh, and so uh, we have, uh, mm, in, in this way, uh, found that probably uh, uh, the shroud was produced in, uh, during uh, the time of uh, the Jesus Christ's life. Uh, because uh, this uh, uh, system of, uh, uh, to, to maintain a uh, closed uh, uh, the eyelids was used only during uh, this time, that time. Are you going to do any new tests now? Any new tests tomorrow or the next day? Yeah, yeah we have also prepared, uh, you have seen uh, uh, an image where we have uh, uh, get, get off all uh, the, the wounds uh -huh. uh, to obtain uh, possibly uh, the natural image of Jesus Christ. That's, that's <laughs> yes. And uh, then uh, we are uh, uh, also we have uh, prepared an image, a three-dimensional image of the, of the, of the body, all, all the, the image of which I have uh, spoken are three-dimensional. So, uh, now we have uh, studying uh, the particulars, uh, the the details uh, to to see the uh, uh, to, to to solve uh, many problems uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the anatomic constitution of, of the body of the shroud man. <laughs> the Congress must have been very exciting. Professor Tamburelli, director of the Center for Telecommunications Research, explained as simply as he could what is meant by computer enhancement and digital elaboration, and how the computer is able to create likenesses by measuring the varying distances between the cloth and the face as it lay over the face. It takes the computer, once programmed, two minutes to create the likeness of the face of the man on the shroud. We speeded up the process in filming to approximately 30 seconds. If the man on the shroud is Jesus Christ, then many feel this is what he looked like. I'm absolutely certain this is an image. The from... artist's concept of what science is accomplishing is always fascinating. A human body, a person who had been crucified in the manner that Christ was crucified. Some years ago, to establish uh, a theory of mine about photographic vision, I developed a process which enables me to put flat pictures into solid, into three dimensions. And any, with any ordinary flat picture, and using this process, I can produce a solid three-dimensional image, which can then be photographed from many angles. 
Um, it was some years after I perfected this that I first saw the uh, face on the Holy Shroud of Turin. And the image was absolutely perfect, this process. It was completely full face. It had a lovely photographic gradation. And I, since I love playing with photographic images, I used this process to put the face into solid. And uh, there were some very interesting results. It also so happens, as a, a slight bonus, really, there's also a picture of the back of the head. And so I was able to use this process double, as it were, from the face side and from the back of the head and produce a complete round bust of the image on the Holy Shroud of Turin. That I'd always been mystified by the fact that whenever I worked on this uh, image, this bust, there were two furrows going down between the hair and the face. And it looked quite unnatural to me. And I'd tried many times to produce uh, a representation without these furrows. Apparently, um, the, the Jewish custom uh, when, when, when people die is to, is to tie up uh, a, a, a sort of bandage to keep, keep, the, keep the mouth closed. And this would have kept the hair away from the face. And apparently, Christ did die um, on, a, on a Friday, and they had time only to perform the first and primitive rites of the, Christ, of the um, Jewish burial. And this is the apparently the explanation for it, which these things are, little things like this happen about the Shroud the whole time, which are absolutely fascinating and sometimes quite inexplicable. We are certainly aware of the involvement of Catholicism. But what of Protestantism? More and more, all over the world, Protestants who tend to diminish the importance of relics in religion are beginning to become aware and believe in the Holy Shroud. Men like the Anglican Right Reverend Dr. John Robinson of Trinity College, Cambridge, one of the world's foremost scholars on the New Testament, considered by many a skeptic, has committed himself to leadership of this ecumenical movement and is now a staunch believer in the Holy Shroud of Turin. If it is authentic, then uh, I don't think it will make any difference to my faith but it must surely make a good deal of evidence to disbelief uh, because it will shake a great many people's uh, dogmatic assumptions that all sorts of things could not be true. I think indeed that if the shroud is authentic, it shall have the effect of teaching us, like every other scientific advance, that the more we know, the more we do not know. It may humble us to confess that in the words of my great Puritan namesake, John Robinson, God hath yet more truth to break forth from his holy shroud. As I say, it would not affect my faith, but it could affect unbelief. For if in the recognition of the face and the hands and the feet and the crown of thorns and all the other wounds, we, like those who knew him best, have to say it is the Lord, then we may have to learn to count ourselves among those who have seen and believed. And that, as St. John makes clear, brings with it no special blessing, but rather special responsibility. course of the exposition, every Wednesday morning is set aside especially for the infirm and the handicapped. It means so much to so many, the faith and comfort these people receive. The spiritual and emotional uplift felt by this inspirational pilgrimage must be a remarkable experience.
One of the many human interest stories to come out of this exposition happened to this woman, Josephine Wallum, walking with Father Rinaldi and Leonard Cheshire in 1955, at ten years of age, and the victim of osteomyelitis, Josie heard of the shroud. As with the child's faith, Josie was sure if she saw and touched this most holy relic, she would be cured. She made contact with Leonard Cheshire, who had been touring England on behalf of the Shroud. He didn't know how they could succeed where others had always failed. Arriving in Turin and bringing a special white dress for the occasion, she finally softened the Cardinal, who telephoned the Vatican and obtained permission. What a fantastic experience for a young person. Caught up in this human drama, the Cardinal allowed Josie to touch the cloth. No miracle occurred, but with a renewed faith, Josie faced life, and over the years her health improved. So much so that today, a married woman with a family, she revisits Turin. Josie, how do you feel about this wonderful visit to Turin? I'm very thrilled to come back here today, to see this dream fulfilled, to see so many people walking around, looking at this exhibition, and seeing the Holy Shroud itself, which we, we have yet to see, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing it. If I were to ask you what the prevalent feeling is in your heart, how would you express it? Just to say how pleased I am to have been able to come today. It's a joy. And we share fully your joy today. And we wish your stay to be most pleasant in every way. The Second International Congress formally ends with a burst of enthusiasm for more sophisticated testing of the Holy Shroud, the ultimate test, carbon-14. A satisfactory answer at the moment. The answer we were given was that carbon-14 was not required or foreseen among the tests. This may be the case in Turin, but if there is one test that the world is waiting to come from this Congress and the examination that follows, it is carbon-14. 
the shroud is waiting to have the authenticity confirmed. There's so many details are going towards the authenticity. This one thing, this one extra step is all that is asked for. Meeting is over. But now the testing begins and the world awaits the results. We were fortunate to be able to meet and speak with many of the dignitaries of the exposition and Congress in a more informal atmosphere. We asked Dr. Robert Bucklin how he felt about the expanding interest in the Holy Shroud to Rin when such a short time ago so few knew of it. I think it's inevitable that the interest will increase at this point. The, uh, the worldwide knowledge of the Shroud is certainly increasing with the exposition which was made here and now with the emphasis on science and the need to try and document the things which we believe is going to bring the Shroud into the, into the forefront of thinking of a great many people. We asked as a scientist and from a scientific point of view what impact he thought the recognition of the Shroud would have on the world. It can only have the impact of solidifying the, the thought of consolidating the ideas of people as it relates to their religious beliefs. I think it's going to emphasize the validity of the Gospels and uh, it's very easy to carry over into a very deeply religious impact from that point. And finally, was he personally satisfied with all that occurred? Extremely satisfied, yes. I think this is well, that's the culmination of my efforts. I had not seen the Shroud before this week. And the experience of being there a few feet away is something which uh, I can't express the, the, the deep uh, feelings I have for it. It's just something which is uh, very intense in my own thinking. And Father Peter Rinaldi, a man so devoted, so sincere, spanning 45 years, both here and in Italy, in dedication to this holy shroud. We asked him what were his first impressions of the shroud in 1933, as he was one of the few people to have been to both expositions. Uh, you might know that I was an altar boy in the Turin, and I shall never forget when a priest called a few of us young boys and spoke so feelingly about the Shroud. I was literally enthralled. I must have been about 12, but for some reason, this thing never left me. When I came back later in 1933 and was privileged to see the Holy Shroud, it revived again. And I shall never forget that I felt a sense and urge to make it known, to share this thing with others. So you may well imagine what this particular event, this exposition, has meant to me personally. It is the fulfillment of a dream I should have never expected to be fulfilled in such a way. We have everything. We have marvelous crowds, a manifestation of faith and reverence, the like of which Turing has not seen in many, many years. We now have a group of European and American scientists who are probing the mystery of this wonderful if you ask me at this point, did you visualize, did you expect anything like this? I would say, certainly not in the way in which it has happened. That something might have been done, I knew, but that, that it should be done in this way, with such a participation of people both from the religious and the scientific aspect that I never expected. And for that, 
I am deeply blessed. We have come to a point which I believe will undoubtedly produce even great results. I have often said this. The most wonderful things about the Holy Spirit have yet to be told. I am convinced that what we will find through this research will not only add to the sum of evidence which we already have pointed to the authenticity of this relic, but will heighten the interest in the world and as I said before, creating a great awareness of Christ. My personal opinion is that the Shroud of Turin is unquestionably the Shroud of Christ. The image that is on the Shroud is a true photographic image, in my opinion, untouched by hand, not made by man. From my own personal point of view, I believe very strongly that the Shroud of Turin is authentic, and I have no doubt in my mind that the imprints on the body are those of Jesus Christ. After a long study of the Shroud, from its historical, scriptural, archaeological, scientific, and medical aspects, showing a man whose face has been battered, whose body has been scourged back and front, whose head has been crowned with thorns, who has been crucified and had his side pierced. It is my opinion that the man of the shroud is Jesus Christ. The sea of humanity flooding the area, day after day. Waiting eight hours and sometimes many more. must mean something, over three million people. A once in a lifetime chance. Believers, agnostics and non-believers alike. So many points of view, so many interpretations of the Gospels, the experiments, the photographs, all the evidence. The final resolution of authenticity may be a long way off, but think of the consequences, not only to the Christian world, but to the entire world. Awesome, but so are the stars in the universe. There are so many as yet incomprehensible aspects to our existence. So how can one say categorically no to anything? So we have shown you some of the facts. We don't say no. Millions don't. Do you? Can you? In light of the evidence which is really just beginning. Is the Holy Shroud of Turin authentic? Is the image on the shroud real? And was it produced by a scorch or radiation, if you prefer? And is the man on the shroud the man called Jesus Christ? We leave it to you.
Thank you.